Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Brandon Brooks, Hector Bones, Dan Crafton, and three new patrons over the weekend, Jace, Carla, and Nick. Everybody welcome Jace, Woo-hoo. Carla, and Nick. Woo-hoo. Yeah. On this episode of DTNS, the best warehouse robot is not from Amazon. Apple and Epic keep spatting, and Chris Ashley is here to discuss when to buy commercial equipment instead of going consumer grade. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 8th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. And from somewhere near your nation's capital, your boy, Big Chris Ashley. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. I, I, every time you say that, I always have, feel compelled to point out that there's definitely someone thinking, well, it's not my nation. I'm <laughs> Canadian, Bulgarian, Japanese, whatever they are. Uh, true enough. But, true yeah. enough. Your favorite nation's capital. <laughs> no, no, that doesn't work either, does it? Okay, never mind. Uh, but yes, it's good to have you, Chris Ashley. How you been? I've uh, been good. Been good. The business is doing really, really good. Really fun. And, yeah. Uh, I even to the point where I actually put in an order for a bigger smoker. Oh, you're gonna need a bigger smoker. That's good. Yeah, it's getting yeah. crazy. Pushing those racks of ribs, pushing those That's briskets, it. slinging and ribs. Yeah, <laughs> slinging ribs and having a good time doing it. Well, we're gonna take advantage of some of the experiences you've had, technologically speaking, yes. in slinging those ribs. Uh, did you see that Bloomberg's Mark Gurman says that when Apple uh, releases iOS 18.4 in the spring, we'll get Apple intelligence? Apple said it was coming next year. We knew it wasn't coming in September, but we're getting it. We're getting it in the spring, says says German. So yeah, yeah that's nice. pretty interesting. I want to see what they bring to the table. Yeah, me too. Uh, but it, it's a good reminder that it's not coming soon. So let's look <laughs> at what is coming soon in the quick hits. Nothing Phone has announced three new products under its budget-friendly sub-brand, the honor to its Huawei. Uh, CMF is the name of the brand. The CMF One Phone has a swappable back cover, making it easy to do repairs, as well as change out what your phone looks like. Also has an attachment point for accessories like stands and lanyards. It's $200.00. Mid-range specs, but 200 bucks, and available now. The CMF Watch Pro 2 is a round watch with GPS, accelerometer, light sensor, health sensors, and they say it should get 11 days on a charge, or if you're using it really heavily, nine days on a charge. You can also swap out the bezel if you want to change the look. Uh, it's $69 available July 11th. And finally the CMF buds pro two, cause they actually put out buds under the CMF brand already. The buds pro two can do active noise cancellation and spatial audio. There's a dial on the charging case that of course can do volume, but also trigger things like play, pause, track, skipping, noise cancellation. It's customizable. The CMF buds pro two are $59 and those are also available on July 11th. Those are bad looking devices. Yeah, they're they not bad. Pretty good. Good prices too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Bloomberg stores say Microsoft will only allow its Chinese employees to use iPhones starting in September. Android phones in China do not have the Google Play Store, making it more difficult to distribute security apps like authenticators for Microsoft employees. So wow. safety first. Cats safety and dogs first. sleeping together. Uh, Cyber News uncovered the largest password compilation ever, numbering close to 10 billion passwords. So you're going to see this on your local news, I expect. Certainly getting a lot of headlines in a lot of places. It was posted on July 4th. Uh, a previous compilation of about 8.4 billion passwords was posted in 2021. By all accounts, that was the previous record holder for most stolen passwords compiled in a single file. Uh, these are less severe than they seem. These are compilations of other breaches. Uh, they are not breaches themselves. They just go find passwords that have been exfiltrated in other ways. A lot of them are long expired passwords if people have been doing their job right. They are probably most useful for attackers who try them at other accounts, what's called credential stuffing where you take a password somebody used to use somewhere and then you try it at other places and see if maybe they were reusing their passwords which is of course why you should not reuse your passwords yeah and with that said please 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 wherever available turn on two-factor authentication definitely 
Windows Notepad, believe it or not, now has autocorrect and spell check for all Windows 11 users. You can turn it on and off in settings and configure it for specific file types. It's off by default for log files and few other coding related file types. Thorat notes that Notepad started to get more frequent feature updates when it was made available in the Microsoft Store with the launch of Windows 11 in October 2021. <laughs> yeah, it basically went from 1983 till 2021. <laughs> <laughs> with very few updates because it was part of the operating system. Once they freed it from the operating system, it became easier to update. Uh, and Mt. Gox, remember Mt. Gox? Yeah. Uh, one of the early hot Bitcoin exchanges. It went bankrupt in 2014 uh, after a 2011 breach where it lost about 950,000 coins. Mm -hmm. uh, the company has been holding a small subset of those coins that they were able to recover and have now agreed to return partial deposits to people. So you're not going to get all your Bitcoin back, but what you'll get back is worth a lot more now than it was back in 2011. Bitcoin was trading at about $600 a coin in 2011. It's currently down a little, but still $60,000 a coin. Uh, distribution to the site's 20,000 creditors is supposed to begin next month. <laughs> all right, Chris, when I say robotic warehouse, what's the first company that jumps to your mind? Uh, always Amazon, yeah. Amazon, yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Uh, and, and they're very good at it. Uh, they've done a great job of having people come do tours and showing off video and getting newscasters to come. Uh, and they're not bad. I'm not saying anything bad about Amazon's robotic warehouse. They're pretty good. However, I do think that's why I wanted to point out on this show the story out today that there is a new partnership between UK's Okado, O-C-A-D-O, -O, and Japan's Aeon as in Aeon Flux, A-E-O-N, <laughs> uh, to build their third robotic warehouse in Saitama Prefecture that plans to go into operation in 27. Now, if you're Japanese, you know Aeon, but if, you, if you're uh, that don't, not familiar with Aeon, uh, they operate retail all over Japan and throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, more prominent businesses include the Aeon hypermarkets, Aeon malls. There's the Daiei supermarkets. If you've ever traveled in Japan, you might've run into those. You probably ran across a mini stop convenience store. Those are all part of Aeon. Okado is a grocery and retail technology provider with clients around the world. Uh, if you're in the UK, they're providing the tech for Morrison's or Waitrose, Marks and Spencer. In the UK, uh, in Canada, you're going to find them inside a Sobeys. In the US, if you've gone to a Kroger or a Ralph's or one of the Kroger sub-brands, you're going to see the technology from Okado. You won't realize it, but that's what's powering things. In Australia, it's Kohl's Group. The list goes on. In fact, uh, Okado just announced a delay to the fourth robotic warehouse for Sobeys in Canada. So it's doing a lot of these robotic warehouses. And Okado's not the only one doing them. There's Switzerland's Swiss Long, Norway's Auto Store. Uh, Walmart uses a U.S. company called Symbotic. What these warehouses do is package all of the groceries together to be able to deliver them fast to the stores. Okado is likely the most advanced with computer vision systems that can track objects and instruct robotic arms how to grasp objects and carry them to the right location. Uh, there's some pretty famous video around there. If you've ever seen a huge grid with robotic arms and robotic boxes just racing around and like dropping down and picking up apples and boxes of fruit and things and putting them in a box. Uh, that is Okado. Uh, Okado is expanding beyond groceries as well. They're going to other retail sectors. If you're in Canada, McKesson Pharmaceuticals distributor uh, is signing on to use Okado's tech. Um, I just think this was worth pointing out. And, and again, Chris, not that I'm, I'm trashing Amazon. They have very good robotics warehouse stuff. This is not like the drones where I was, was, mocking Amazon for years about only having a demo in 60 minutes and no actual product. Uh, th this is something that Amazon's very good at, but I don't think people realize there's a lot of other companies that are just as good as Amazon uh, at this sort of thing. And some like Okado that people in the industry seem to think are better. Yeah. If you watch this operation go down, you can't help but be impressed by just the coordination and all the little tiny square robots moving back and forth and side to side uh, to to load things up. Uh, you know, I'm OK with this aspect of it kind of being more on the warehouse side. 
uh, I, you know, as long as they, you know, keep up with their statement of keeping uh, regular humans involved to kind of, you know, quality check and, and do those things because nothing could be worse than, you know, these things just start going haywire and grabbing all the wrong stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you don't want them just, uh, you don't want to unleash them. I think that's the other thing is you don't have the hype around the Okado systems. Uh, right. There was an article from the BBC where Okado was like, yeah, these, these aren't great at everything. We're slowly making them better at more things, but we still need humans for certain jobs like picking for freshness or, you know, picking uh, things that don't have a uniform shape. Uh, they used wine bottles as an example, because wine bottles from different manufacturers are all, all shaped sure. different. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a lot of need for humans. And Okada was saying all the right things of like, we're not using this this automation to replace humans. We're using it to free up the humans we employ to be able to do more so that we can expand and deliver more to our clients, which is probably, in my opinion, the smart thing and certainly what you want to hear them saying. Yeah, certainly exactly what I want to hear, at least. And, you know, I, I've just now started taking more advantage of like uh, Instacart and stuff like that because, you know, being on the food truck and it, there are times where I just do not have time to run to a st one store or the other. And, yeah. you know, trying to be profitable, you know, I got to get certain things from this store and certain things from that store and certain things from this other store, um, you know, because the prices are better. But I just don't always have the time to split myself up and do that. So I'll you know, have my wife do an Instacart order you know, in between to the house and pick that stuff up. But, you know, that even with humans still lies the same problem, maybe less so to a degree, because where you have like uh, cans of beans or, you know, um, uh, cheese, you know, a box of cheese or, uh, or a carton of milk is not too much quality or discernment that needs to go on yeah, when purchasing yeah. those type of items. But, you know, when I say, OK, pick me up two briskets. I'm looking for certain features in that brisket, you know, and if I, you know, and if I get one where, it's, you know, the, the, the end of it is super thin, that's annoying to me because I'm going to end up cutting that off and not using it at all. Yeah. Um, so, there, you know, so I like the aspect of human uh, interaction, but ultimately, uh, you know, and, and unless there is just a way to, you know, they think about that for the future to kind of add those type of criteria into the selection process. Yeah, they yeah. they're going to need to keep that in place. Uh, Clinton points out he's had a couple of grocery pickup orders that were processed in an automated warehouse. So you may you may have seen the fruits of some of these companies' labors uh, without even realizing it. I do think that the argument should go, and the smart companies will follow this. Uh, you you imagine this. Uh, somebody is busy doing the picking for everything, a human person, right? And they're picking the beans and they're picking everything and they're, they're harried, they're running behind, they're busy. And so when they pick your brisket, they don't look at it. They're like, the guy needs a brisket. I'm going to grab the brisket and I'm going to throw it in there. And then occasionally you get one, you're like, this is not acceptable and you have to send it back and everybody loses. In an automated system where the automated system is doing all the easy stuff, picking the beans, picking everything else, you have the human able to take time to say, ah, one of our differentiators is that we can make sure we pick brisket that fits Chris's tastes, that is meets his expectations. And right. so he's never going to send it back. And then Chris is more likely to buy his brisket from us because we always do it right. Uh, and therefore the company makes more money. The human worker is less stressed uh, and the automation has made life better for everybody. Couldn't agree with you more. I think that's that that would be the ideal scenario, and that's something I would welcome for sure. Yeah, I'm not saying everybody's going to do that, no, we know. <laughs> but but <laughs> but the ones who who do will win in the end, right? Because because yeah. they'll have the better service. Yeah, I I still crave human interaction when I go to a grocery store. So yeah, I it depends. <laughs> it depends on the checker. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. There are, there are times when I'm like, I see a particular checker. I'm like, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll go out. And then other times I'm like, you know, I'll just do self checkout this time. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, let's move on to our second top story of today in my never ending quest to make sense of the never ending saga of Apple versus Epic. I will now bring you up to speed, Chris, on the series of events, Please starting do. with, Europe's Digital Markets Act, which requires Apple to allow third-party apps and third-party app stores on its platform in the EU, right? You were aware of that one, I'm sure. Yes. Apple is allowed to notarize those stores. 
So they get to ensure that they meet minimum safety standards, that they're not pretending to be something they aren't, that they're not scams, uh, that they're not trying to imitate the Apple App Store, for example, and fool people into thinking they're at the Apple Store when they're not. Uh, in fact, that is one that if Apple is saying uh, is a problem with Epic. Friday, Epic said its third-party App Store was rejected for notarization twice because Apple said its download button and some related copy were too similar to the Apple App Stores. Now, we talked about that on Friday's show. A few hours after that, uh, Apple approved the Epic Apple Store or uh, Epic App Store but still said it had asked Epic to modify the buttons in future submissions. Epic said there's nothing wrong with its buttons, that it is following exactly the standards of most things on iOS, uh, and it's going to complain to the EU if it's made to change these buttons. Chris, on a scale of 1 to 10, how silly is this argument between these two? <laughs> I think the situation is silly. However, the argument itself is probably a five. It's right in the middle. All right. All right. Why a all five? Right, so let, let me let me sell this to you. So there's a couple of rings, a couple things. Uh, first, I think Apple should always have the right to make sure that those things, those little uh, modifications occur, that people don't mistake their products for, for Apple products, right? Because with Apple comes a certain amount of... Uh, what do you say? Uh, cachet. Cachet, right. And so, the, you know, you, you can't just give that away. But at the other, any other time, you know, the fact that Apple just turned around and was like, all right, we're going to let it through and just fix it later on, on the next one. Yeah, the, immediately you know that this was not that big a deal and it was not an egregious uh, <laughs> violation at, to, be, to be rejected twice. So definitely some silliness on both parts. But I would also say that I, I don't know why, but uh, I get the gut feeling that Epic may be testing the waters to see exactly how much they can get away with and how much they can, how, how far they can push and, you know, kind of bruise their way into the App Store even more. Uh, so I don't know. I just, that's why I kind of I can't just say it's totally silly. It's just partially silly that we're even still go talking about this in the first place. Yeah, I might put it more at a six or seven, but I get where you're coming from. There are real reasons why Epic could be upset and like, look, we're trying to play by the rules and, and you're being over overly critical or you're being a stickler. Apple also has the right to be a stickler. Like we want to make sure there's no confusion. But when it came down to like your download button, which Apple says get on their download button. Epic apparently was saying install. So to me, like those are all, those are install is pretty normal language. I don't know. It, it just feels like these two companies are so done with each other that right. they just don't want to give any kind of latitude uh, to the other one where they might with, with a smaller developer or somebody they didn't know as well. Yeah, totally agree that there is definitely some, uh, a bit of, I'm, I'm finished with this uh, in there as well. And uh, yeah, and probably, probably rightfully so. This has been going on for a long, long time. But, you know, as a guy that formerly worked in software and has seen how uh, different or organizations were cracked, there have been quite a few times that mm. uh, somebody got in through a third party software. And so it is on Apple, no matter what, because if something does happen and it's a result of, you know, coming in through Epic or something they did in their app store, Apple's going to get blamed no matter yeah. what. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I get that you should keep the bar farther than the possible breach that you think could happen to just yeah. make, make extra sure that nothing bad's going to happen. I think the label on the download button is probably pretty far away <laughs> from being that, but you know, maybe there's more to it. Uh, I'm willing to entertain that. Uh, I, I do think in the end, Apple did the right thing and just said, fine, we'll, we'll let it through. Uh, yeah, and, that was smart. It, and yeah, they're not going to win this one. They, they still look bad from the original argument. Oh and, yeah. For and sure. the original fight. So yeah, they, that was the smart thing to do. Well, this is one of several stories in the show today that was submitted on our subreddit. Uh, we pay attention to that. It's not the only place we get stories, but we definitely get stories from there. And a lot of times stories that we're already thinking about when we see them on the subreddit, where we give them a little extra weight. So get in there and join all the folks who are submitting and voting on stories at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. 
When we talk about consumer tech, uh, we often separate it from enterprise tech or commercial tech or industrial tech. Uh, we probably all assume, well, you, know, you don't want to buy, you know, the the commercial version. It's going to be too big or it's going to use too so much power, you know, or it's or it's a it's built around a use case of, you know, people making a million sandwiches a day. And I just need to make a few. Uh, Chris, you found, speaking of sandwiches, that in barbecue gear, the difference could be a little more important than we understand. Yeah, this uh, had an incident that really made me rethink um, whether people that are power users, should you start considering uh, buying more con uh, con uh, commercial grade gear versus regular gear? And uh, you know, hear me out. So I have a controller uh, my tech control, my barbecue controller I use on my smoker. I've been using that thing for years. I love this company. They work really well, and it allows me to remotely control the temperature of my smoker as well as remotely monitor the temperature of my food that I'm cooking. And even to the point where I can set up like uh, – uh, s settings where it's like, okay, once this piece of meat hits this temperature, drop the temperature of the smoker down so you can hmm. kind of hold it. You know, so there's all types of cool things you can do. But the problem was, uh, and you know, like I said, I've used this thing for years, and within three months of me using it on my food truck, it it, it ran into a pretty big issue. Um, and it got pretty expensive pretty quickly because I was cooking a bunch of food mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden my fan wasn't working. And so what happened was I said, OK, the fan must have died. I'll work yeah. without it for now. I ordered three fans because I was like, this is sure. never going to happen to me again. I get the new fan, plug it in. Still not working. Oh. I call up their tech support and they're like, yeah, the port is bad. And I was like, wow, I was using this on my food truck. I've never seen this before. And they're like, ah. This thing is not commercially rated, sir, mm -hmm. and I was, it cannot stand up to the wear and tear of being constantly plugged in, plugged out, plugged in, plugged out, plugged in, plugged out. And sure enough, the port died on the actual controller itself. And so that was like, well, what other things in my life do I have that I'll probably use more constantly or I just want the added mental security that this thing is not going to die when I most need it because it's not a far-fetched idea. I know a lot of people that ran Windows NT uh, back in the day when there were two different versions of Windows or even, you know, Windows 2000, that, you know, people were using the commercial version of Windows versus the consumer version of Windows. Yeah. Now, that's, you know, obviously that's since merged, but there are different, uh, definitely other things. I know Rod, my co-host on um, Barbecue and Tech, uh, uses a commercial grade Wi-Fi, and I've probably replaced mine twice in the time mm -hmm. he's had that thing. So it just got me to thinking. Is maybe I'm taking this too far, but I I know you said that you had some uh, thoughts around this as well. Yeah, yeah. One that just occurred to me. Uh, I I burnt out the sensor on a camera once because I just was leaving it on, uh, not realizing back then that there's a difference between a camera meant to be on all the time, like a security camera and a camera that's meant to just turn on when you take some pictures or do some video and then turn off again. Uh, so there's that kind of situation, kind of similar to your port. I also have commercial internet service, not because there's any real difference, but because the service is going to be different, not even always better, but I know I can get a customer on the line. I have a service level agreement I can refer to and say, hey, customer service agent, not a customer on the line, a customer service yeah. agent on the line uh, and say, hey, I'm supposed to be getting this. Uh, I'm not, I know I'm not going to get caps. I know I'm not going to get weird questions about like, hey, why are you using so much bandwidth in the upload? And it, because I can say, because it's my business. So there are reasons like that. That, that I think apply to equipment sometimes too. Sure. Of if you're going to get the service you need at a higher level, maybe it's worth getting uh, the commercial grade equipment as well. I will add that uh, when it comes to laptops, outside of a MacBook, I generally stay away from thin and light notebooks. And I've been drawn toward uh, 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 mobile workstations. They're basically laptops, except that. They're the kind of laptops that you might have used maybe like 10 or 12 years ago. These things weigh around like three to four pounds. They're very big, plasticky. Um, and one of the cool things about them, about them, though, is that they fold completely flat. Like they're designed to be used in a uh, situation where uh -huh. you're either in a, in a high 
in a in a in a high temperature environment. Um, these things have uh, cooling that's a little bit above and beyond what you would get with the thin and light. They also have more space. So they have space for larger fans. They have space for more cooling. They have massive vents on the side. Mm-hmm. Um, also, because it is a workstation from, in this case, Dell, um, Dell constantly provides updates for it. In fact, they stopped uh, issuing updates for this particular laptop uh, last year, so of December 2023. But if you go to their website, you can find BIOS updates, you can find firmware updates for all the stuff inside. So if you're looking for, oh, I want to make sure I, I, I'm fully covered, these workstations, because they're designed for a corporate environment, Dell is very conscientious about making sure it has all the updates. Because the last thing they need is to deal with a corporate customer that's you know yelling at them that maybe yeah i've got a hundred laptops that just broke et cetera et cetera yeah yeah and so and uh you know and this one's a little this one's about six years old so it's not the latest and greatest but it works great so windows 11 support has the tpm module uh you can strip it apart yeah i could take off the keyboard i can take repairability is sometimes better with industrial and commercial stuff Yeah. yeah you can take out the screen and i can replace it with a 4k screen as an option if i go to ebay uh and speaking of ebay if you're looking for a hard drive and you want something that will not break Enterprise hard drives that they sell on eBay, depending on the buyer, um, they're used, oftentimes they're used for half their life, but these things have millions, designed for millions of cycles. Uh, so they, they generally last pretty long, although I will st- stress, you don't want to uh, use it for uh, data, you know, um, data you want to make sure you never You don't want to use but- it for your backup. Because exactly. it's, it's at half his life. But yeah, if yeah. you're using, you don't if you're really using, know what its life is. If you're using for a NAS or, or you know, an 8-bay uh, uh, NAS that you have in your small office, they're great. Um, the only thing I would uh, caution on people is they're not very power efficient, so they chew up a lot of juice. And they're very loud because they're designed to be in a server room where no one lives. But if you yeah, plan on sense. putting one of these in your bedroom, you'll probably be uh, having dreams about uh, chitter-chatter <laughs> uh, for most of the night. <laughs> Yeah, I just think about it from a from a power user perspective for the folks that support. Um, and these are the people I love talking to, right? These are the people that support their family members. They're the ones who get that first phone call. Would your life be better served if you start making your customers, if you will, uh, spend a little bit more money on something that's going to last a little bit longer or be able to take a, a bigger beating, you know, if you had the skill set to enact policies on your family members' computers, you know, and in a sense, yes, you stop making them administrators on their machines, but you take advantage of some of those enterprise policies, and now you're protecting them from themselves, right? They can't just install anything willy-nilly, and, you know, most likely they don't get uh, hit some type of worm or something that's going to take over the machine. So it's, it's really got me thinking just from this one little barbecue incident, you know, to start thinking about all the stuff that I have here and like, what, what can I replace and, um, and kind of eliminate some of the headaches. Yeah. I mean, the downside is sometimes the commercial version of something is no different than the consumer version except the price. So right. you, you have to investigate. Did they actually use better parts? Is there actually a better warranty or better service for this, 100%. like Roger was talking about with the Dell? Is it actually rated for more plugging and unplugging, uh, like the like the controller that, that Chris was talking about? Uh, sometimes it is, but, but you want to make sure before you pay extra, because sometimes yeah. they just charge businesses more because businesses aren't going to look that closely. And while I was traveling for work so much, I started looking for the smaller, smaller, the skinnier, the lighter laptop. But now that I'm looking for a laptop for the food truck, because oftentimes, you know, I'm sitting on there and I'm, uh, you know, just waiting for something to finish so I can wrap it or something. And I was like, and I need a a laptop because I can't do all the billing and stuff from the, from the tablet, um, from the iPad. So I started looking, I started looking at laptops and I looked at the uh, Microsoft's new, um, uh, their what what do they call them? Shoot, Surface. Yeah, the oh, new the, Surface. Oh, uh, the Copilot Plus. Copilot uh, enabled yeah. Surface, and I was like, man, uh-huh. that thing is so small. 
I, I'm afraid if one drop <laughs> and that thing is going to take a fat L. <laughs> goes to the fryer <laughs> accidentally. Oh, yeah. It's going to fall and it's going to be full of grease in no time. And it's, yeah. like, it's just not going to hold up. <laughs> and it's just like, uh, so I started yeah. looking at, you know, the, the desktop style laptops like you, like you just showed, Roger. So yeah, there is that something that's built to take a little more abuse, be used in a field, maybe something like right. that. Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, if you've got thoughts about using commercial versus uh, consumer equipment, when to do so, when not to, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. James in Columbus, Ohio, had some thoughts about our discussion of teachers using automated software for grading. James said, I understand the desire to remain teacher positive in your reporting of this story, but it leaves out a possible benefit. Often we question the possibility of bias with AI, which is fair. With AI, though, we have the opportunity to refine the system to make it fairer. With an individual person, the bias can be more difficult to remove. Having benefited as well as been hurt by teacher biases in the past, I think that AI gives the opportunity for a fairer grading system, hopefully. There are many biases that teachers fall into, the more recognized biases regarding gender and race, but also biases regarding personality leading to teachers, pets, and troublemakers. These biases can and do influence the grade students receive either deliberately or subconsciously, AI hopefully will someday lead to more fair assessments of student work. Brilliant. Yeah. I think it's it's a good uh, it's a good point that James makes that uh, there's bias in both ends. Uh, and so you know maybe maybe you need to team them up uh, yeah. a little, you know, and balance it out. Uh, Paul Reese on Patreon found it humorous that uh, both me and Sarah talked about how we never used the Google app on the iPhone. Uh, Paul says, since it became available, I have always used the app to look up things on Google and for the last 18 months or so have always operated it in incognito mode. Mm. So I've there never you go. used it either. Ever. Yeah, I I think Paul may be still in the uh, the smaller percentage of people that, that use it, uh, perhaps. But I asked him about it, and he's like, "Yeah, I kind of use it like a reference work." I, I when he's not doing a search for a website specifically, but looking for an answer on something, and I'm like, "Oh, yeah," and using it in incognito mode means that nobody finds out anything else except that one search. Well, Chris Ashley, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and sharing your experience with the the barbecue and tech stuff as well. If people want to find out more about what you've got going on. Where should they go? Yeah, definitely uh, check out you know any of the podcasts, uh, barbecue and tech or uh, uh, SMR podcast. But you know, check us out on social media because I've posted some really cool, uh, good looking food videos and oh, pictures yes. on there as well, and uh, some of them. You know, I, I've been doing barbecue for 15 years and I'm still learning how to make it better. And uh, being able to show some of these cool pictures and some of the cool breweries I've been hanging out at. And, you know, it's been a lot. It's, it's a lot of fun and some really cool pics going up. So check I would those out. warn you, it will make you hungry. Yes. So go Step check one. that out. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, Chris and I are going to talk about a study that found that ChatGPT is excellent at solving coding problems as long as they're from before 2021. Uh, if they were published later than 2021, not great. We're going to talk about how not great and why. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>